do with the strange but inevitable death of the soul. Even the great god Ray himself could not withstand the sorcery of Isis. Even the deities, like the great order of the Odinic gods of the Scandinavian peoples, come finally to the God of Amaron, to the twilight, to the destruction, to the end of the world, where gods and mortals perish together. Thus in the Egyptian rite, it became very important for man to understand the mortality of his own ego. This, in fact, gives us practically the whole substance of Buddhistic doctrine. The Egyptian believed that immortality of the soul had to be earned. That this solar symbol carried not only the promise, but the duty, the burden. For in every case, the sun performs its labor for the benefit of men and dies in the service of the men it seeks to aid. Just as the sun at night goes into darkness to the underworld, just as the annual sun in the processional motion comes finally to winter and dies, just as the sun in the great platonic year moves through the alternative periods of fertility and sterility, so always life follows death, death follows life forever. The ancient was a fatalist on this particular point. But when everything seemed to die, the time came to remember its birth. When everything was born, it was then timely to remember that it must die. Always we should remember the opposite, because each of these stages is bound completely with the other. Therefore, in the effort to understand these strange rites, Ancient man began to contemplate the very thought that we have in the Bible. There are two statements in different parts of the Old Testament which are interesting. One says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. And the other says, but the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Therefore, the soul and the spirit are not the same thing. The soul is the splendid light of the revealed sun. The soul in man is the witness to the Father. The soul in man speaks through Osiris, another solar mystery god. And it speaks through Horus, the only begotten of Osiris. And the god tells us that when we look upon the sun, we have seen the Father which is behind the sun. And we realize that in the Egyptian ritual, the soul, as the only begotten, comes forth as the redeemer of the body, just as the annual son, reborn each year, makes available to man the immediate participation in universal life. The Egyptian was fully aware that all the life in space did not come from our sun. He also was aware of the fact that the sun as we see it was not the source of life. It was merely the one who comes forth, the witness. It is the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So the sun becomes the symbol of the evangelist, the manifesto, the witness. And it is the perpetual reminder that even the light of the sun, like the, the flame of the lamp, bears witness to a deep and mysterious fuel, and the light can blaze no longer than the fuel provides. So in Egypt, behind the great sun mystery of Ray Kapura, uh, we have something else, the dark mystery of the great old gods, the ones who never were revealed, upon whose faces the light of the sun never shone. They were the first, the only one, the Sebi, the ones who remained in darkness, in their mysterious abode of the eternal north, where the path of the sun never came. And these dark gods were the gods of space and eternity. 
and this space and eternity remote and wonderful, eternal and unconditioned, continued on its way through all duration, until from out of the darkness of this profundity burst forth the symbolic symbol or the symbolic form of the solar mystery. The sun, therefore, came to bind heaven and earth came to unbind the heaven and earth, for such were the powers of the Pontifex Maximus, that they shall bind and they shall unbind, and such were the ancient ritual terms. But the sun mystery brought the dark light or the dark life of the supreme cause into manifestation, and it also lifted up men, for its rays ended in hands drawing them into the light. For as the sun draws water, so the mysterious soul sun draws souls upward out of darkness. And souls buried in the earth, like the grave, are brought into release, into spiritual manifestation through the mystery of the Eucharist. And the Eucharist, in this case, is actually the power of water and fire, or sun and moisture. For by partaking of the mystery of the sun and moon, by partaking of the strange Eucharist described at the time of its first establishment by Melchizedek, priest of Salem, we know that there was the mystery of the corn, the wine, and the oil. And in this we find again the Eucharist performed at the Last Supper by Jesus and his disciples. For the bread became the symbol of the corn or the grain. The wine was in the cup of the sacrament. But where was the oil of Melchizedek, the most mysterious factor of all? In the completion of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, the oil was Christ, because the word oil is in Greek, Christos. It is the symbol of the anointing. Therefore, when Christ is referred to as the anointed, it is because of the use. We have the same word in Crisco, our um, uh, present cooking shortening for oil. It comes from the same root. So Christ is the oil. <laughs> the bread and the wine were provided, and the ancient ritual of Melchizedek was repeated, which causes St. Paul to refer to the Messiah as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. As the Scarabasaka was said to be its own father and its own mother, being an androgynous beetle, so we find this strange priestly solar mystery also represented as totally and completely androgynous, like the deity Serapis in the ancient temple. Now the Messiah, or the Anointing One, gives us also another dimension of the solar mystery, because the rays of the sun work the miracles. The sun's rays lift all things and raise all things to themselves. Therefore, they become the symbol of the resurrection of the dead, the restoration of life, and the redemption. The Son also to the ancients stood as the complete and eternal promise. It revealed to men in those days that the power of God could not fail, that the mystery went on forever, and that for always and forever as there was light, and this light was the light of men. And this light came into the world, and the world knew it not, because it could not recognize the mystery of the solar power. But the invisible sun, to Bernie and many other European mystics, was actually the Messiah. Therefore, as the sun was midway between spirit and matter, the Messiah stood as the intermediary between God and man. And none came unto the Father save through the Son. 
This mystery goes on. We find it in the Druid rituals. We find it everywhere we seek to understand the power of salvation and of life. All of which causes us to wonder whether much of our symbolism has not actually come down to us from the very old patterns of things. We do not understand the symbols today in this context. We do not apply them or associate them to these great faiths of long ago, but such association is valid. For we have inevitably drawn upon the older legends and myths and have incorporated them into our sacraments into practically every form of religion and worship that we know today in all parts of the world. This, if this be true then, and there is no doubt that it is true, we must wonder how far we can carry the analogy safely. Because we know that all symbols fall short of the principles for which they stand, no symbol can be in every way accurate or in every way complete. Therefore, we can press interpretation beyond the legitimate point and thus fall into error. How far can we press the analogy between the sun and salvation? How far can we legitimately assume that the ancient himself, searching into the inner life of things with his own strangely intuitive faculties, was able to integrate a really useful and practical concept. I think we must be careful. We can't go all the way with the old symbolism, but we can go further with it than we generally have. And in one uh, case particularly, I think it is valid for us to consider. And that is the part of the old ritual which dealt with the raising up of the human soul into union with the sun. Now in the Egyptian ritual, when Ani, priest of Pharaoh, entered into the underworld, he ceased to be Ani. He ceased to be himself. And from that time on, he is referred to in the ritual only by the name of the god. In other words, he becomes Osiris. To help the early reader in the dynastic days who might have trouble with this concept, uh, the scribe enters in here and there into the text words or something in this arrangement. He said, and now the Osiris which had been Ani, scribe of Pharaoh, does certain things. The Osiris that had been Ani, the soul that had been Ani. Now this Osiris is again our Aserapi or Serapis. And therefore the deceased becomes a kind of godling. And as such he enters into the presence of the great deity. He comes in the likeness of the God himself. He comes beseeching and asking in the name of that which he is like. Now this is very important in religious thinking because it brings out a point that perhaps we have totally neglected in our modern way of life, <coughs> namely the, pro the problem of the individual uh, creating the necessary attributes of his own soul so that this soul can bear witness for him in the afterlife. We assume today, rather smugly perhaps, if we have beliefs at all, that the soul is one of these things that takes care of itself. If it has been good enough, it will have a fortunate hereafter. If it hasn't been good enough, there's nothing much we can do about it except hope for the best. Now such an attitude toward the soul would not have been any part of ancient man's concept. He would have assumed a very simple point, namely that man, moving inevitably out of this life, goes into the sphere of Amentet, goes into the underworld of the night sun, goes into the abode of the winter sun, 
goes down into the earth beneath which the sun disappears at sunset. Therefore it enters into a strange darkness, a strange internal or invisible sphere. Now you have probably remembered for some reason or other that nearly always the ancients placed their after death abode under the earth. Now we have no reason to believe, for example, that hellfire and damnation is just below some of the deeper shafts of Standard Oil Company's oil uh, wells. And we have no reason to believe that if we dug down to the other side, we would find perdition in the core of things. This is not uh, a particularly reasonable concept. Yet ancient man always considered that at death the individual went down, that he left surface and went toward center, in this case of the earth, that in his conscious period he lived in the light of the earth's surface. When he died he was buried in a mound or grave beneath the surface of the earth. Therefore, the underworld was down there. The Chinese believed it. The Egyptians believed it. The Greeks believed it. Always this world was beneath the grave, or perhaps actually was in the grave mounds themselves. Man went down into the world of the dust beneath his feet. The Egyptians believed, therefore, that in some mysterious way, man went down into the place of judgment. But the Egyptian did not have any of our theological concepts. There was no place of punishment in the Egyptian philosophy. The soul either attained, or else it was devoured again by matter and returned to rebirth. There was no hellfire and damnation that uh, controlled or uh, ended the career of souls. Nor was there in the Greek. The worst that they threatened was a shadow land of ghostly continuance. But actually the Egyptian was a psychologist in his own right, and his underworld, lighted by the sacred sun of the mysteries, was something inside. And the apparent symbolism is that in death, the soul returns into the core of itself. It goes back into its own dark nature, which for all intent and purposes could mean that the soul returns to the great hall of the twin truths, which is its own heart. The journey was inward, from the surfaces to the center of things. And in the Egyptian ritual, the dark world of the soul was the inner life of the individual. When the body was gone, when the senses were gone, when the manifesting links and bridges between consciousness and objective physical existence, when these bridges were broken, the soul did not cease. It simply remained in what was left. And when the eyes were closed, there was only darkness for the sight. And when man lost his sensory perceptions and lost his bodily attributes, he was in darkness. He was in the darkness of his own inner life. And in this darkness, he could no longer be gladdened by the light of the physical sun. He could no longer see the great ball rolled across the sky by the Scarabasaka. He saw no phenomenal things of any kind. He dwelt within himself. And he turned, as the Egyptian tells us, and prayed in a strange aloneness, prayed for the rise of the sun of the dawn inside of his own nature. He must therefore depend for light upon the light of the soul, upon the light of the subterranean sun. And this subterranean sun was quite an interesting thing. It had two lives because it represented man's objective psychic center of egoism. When man slept, he died and went back again into his own inner life. When he awakened, he came forth again. 
like Kephara in its glory, rising over the mountains of the east. So objectively in the daytime the sun lighted his outer life. At night it had to light the inner world of his experience. In life it lighted again the outer. In death it had to light the inner. So man depended in his faith beyond the grave upon the sun in his own self or life. Now as the physical globe of the sun represented our objective consciousness, so the mysterious power behind the visible symbol, the soul sun, represented man's internal psychic existence. And the Egyptian was very much concerned with making sure that the sun of the soul shone brightly in the darkness of the inner life. It must be brilliant and strong that the plains of Alu may not be in darkness. Now these plains are these little things that psychologists refer to as our introversional areas of activity. The individual extroverts in life, in death he introverts. In life he pours forth out of himself. In death he returns again to live with himself. To live with the qualities and principles and attributes which are peculiarly his own. And there he comes upon the God of the mysteries. For if he explores the underworld and is faithful and moves through this labyrinth of mysterious tests and trials, he comes finally to the sanctuary to that temple which is the house of hidden places, ruled over by the master of the secret house. And here he comes into the presence of the midnight sun, the internal sun. He sees then within his consciousness a sun blazing in the firmament. And according to the Egyptian, he has a strange experience. For just as surely as materially and physically, when he opens his eyes, he sees a vast world around him, so psychically and mystically. When within his own nature he opens his eyes, he sees a vast universe within him that extends as far and as wonderful as the world around us seems to be. And in this inner mystery, there comes the rising of the sun in glory. And the Egyptian represented this in the state of the blessed soul in contemplation seated quietly in adoration of the great gods, the soul suddenly sees the dawn of the disk of the sun, and Kepra suddenly opens its wings, filling the sky with iridescent light. This is the soul of the mysteries, which the ancients considered as the messianic sun. This is the sun in the soul, which is for the salvation of men. And this sun in the soul has to be earned, it has to be made possible. For when it comes, when it rises, it bestows immortality. For as the ritual of Egypt says, there can be no death when the sun in its risings bestoweth its light. So immortality is the rising of the sun of the soul, or the messianic sun in man. If, therefore, we remember the, the remarks made by Paracelsus, which we have discussed in a previous series, he said there were three suns, one that lighted the body, one that lighted the soul, and one that lighted the spirit. This would be in conformity with the old mysteries, and he probably learned this in Constantinople. In any event, the soul sun is the Messiah, which is for the salvation of the nations. It is the sun of the soul rising over the body. For the final victory to the Egyptians was not the victory of good over evil. This was important, but this was covered more or less by the great negative confession of faith, in which the virtues of the deceased were clearly enumerated. It was not the victory of even light over darkness. It was the victory of life over death. It was the total victory in the consciousness of man. 
It was the entry of the soul into the awareness of the everlastingness. It was man suddenly knowing by the rising of the dawn light of aurora, knowing his own immortality, knowing his own eternity, and dedicating himself to the service of the greater in the presence of the lesser. Thus Kepera in his rising really brings the light of internal truth to man. And illumination, as it is termed in mysticism, or cosmic consciousness, was known to the Egyptians as, of course, the rising of Kepera, or the great scarabus, over the horizon. For it was the blaze of light that lighted not merely the outer forms of things, but the inner structure of them, so that their bodies were full of light. And that this light, and this life, was the assurance of eternal continuance. To achieve this end, therefore, the individual had to uh, not only make his peace with the gods that rule the world, he had not only to give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he had also to make his offering to the sun in its rising. And among the old manuscripts, uh, one uh, papyrus to the Queen Mother of one of the ancient serials is, is very beautiful because we learn from it so much of the philosophy of these people, something that we know so little about, unfortunately. And we learn from these fragments uh, the tremendous challenge of man seeking the path of light in his own soul. Not merely just doing good, but the strange state of being good. Not only performing all the different rituals and rites that are indicated by our laws, our customs, and our traditions, but more than this, the searching after the experience of the rising of the sun. That in some way, while we live, we must have some free awareness of this coming of the great light of the world. For this coming of the great light is the restoration of the martyred God. And it is brought about by the dedication of man to the experience of the light seeker. The orders of the quest in medieval chivalry emphasize this older philosophy very clearly. So always the point throughout life was that the Egyptians, even while he lived, was ever mindful, waiting, hoping for the coming or rising of the inner sun. And he knew the rising of this sun by various ways, most important perhaps being that it brought with it the light of peace. The rising of the sun of truth inside of man is always marked by the increase of internal awareness of value. Man gradually finds that this daybreak, this auroral dawn, as Bailey calls it, ends the strivings and the stress. It ends also the shocks that flesh is heir to. For it is the coming of warmth, of life, of generation, of all good things within the soul of man. Just as man lives physically like his savage forebears, no longer in physical darkness, because this darkness is now riddled with light, but in a state of internal darkness. Man lives in an everlasting night of doubt, burdened from day to day with problems and responsibilities. He finds the path of life not happy, nor can he guard and govern well the values that he has. He sees the world around him on the brink of war and catastrophe. He observes how knowledge is used to destroy both peace and hope. A man is therefore like his savage ancestor, huddling by the little fire he has, afraid of the great darkness which surrounds him. And the little fire is his learning, his knowledge, his faith, his hope. Such flickering rays as he has been able to kindle 
out of the long pathetic history of his kind. But when comes the great dawn, the darkness is no more. St. George slays the dragon with the spear of light. It is the same spear which, according to Omar, touches the turret of the Sultan's palace. It is this great light of inner understanding, the alchemical agent that transforms fear into faith, ignorance into wisdom, superstition into insight. These things man has to accomplish by the rising of Kepler in its glory, the restoration of the sun god within the strange mystery of his own life. To make this more seemingly understandable, the place of the sun in the zodiac and its journey through the years, its labors, uh, were all carefully studied and analyzed to get the analogies that would help to strengthen the doctrine. Man born into this world dies from the world of light. And therefore, this is the entrance to the dark world of the mysteries. In the ancient zodiac, the Egyptians used the symbol of the scarabus, where we now use the crab as a sign of cancer. In all probabilities, the scarab is the correct form and the crab is a more or less compromised uh, form, perhaps due uh, to the corruption of ancient designs or the transference of the symbolism to some area where the scarabus was not significant. In any event, the crab is the symbol, or was the symbol, and the scarabus of the summer solstice. And the summer solstice, of course, was the point of the greatest heat and light of the sun. Therefore, the sun took upon itself at that time in the procession of the equinoxes the body of Kephara, and the sun became the scarab in its glory. Now man, according to the ancient philosophies, in the Mithraic rituals, and of course Mithras is another solar deity, who overcoming the vernal equinox in Taurus flew the bull, and bathed itself in the blood of the bull and became uh, strengthened or became the hero as a result. This was also an astronomical mythos. Perhaps it is this Mithraic rite of the slaying of the bull and the bathing in the blood of it that was the origin of the red shoes of Julius Caesar. For it is said that before Caesar could go into the temple of the deity and act as Pontifex Maximus or high priest he first had to rush home and put on his red shoes without his red shoes he could not enter the temple the red shoes probably came from the feet of the priest who were present at the slaughter of the bull and therefore whose feet were reddened with the blood of sacrifice by the time of Caesar this practice was not carried on but the red shoes lingered like a great many other symbols. And wherever red occurs in vestments of clergy, it represents or is related to sacrifice or to martyrdom. The sacrifice of the bull or the sacrifice of Mithras, who was also among the martyr gods. In any event, the birth of man in the sign of the cancer or the scarabus was the beginning of the great journey of the sun. Now the sun carried on two journeys simultaneously. The first journey was its arch across the sky in the mystery of the year. During this journey it passed from the sign of Cancer, which was the summer solstice, to the great autumnal equinox in the sign of Libra. And here the scales were set up and the great weighing of the psychostasia took place. Here was the dividing point in which life and death had to be decided. And the solar being going on courageously beyond the point of the autumnal equinox was set upon by the three fall months, representing in some instances uh, the murderers or destroyers of the hero or the circumstances of this destruction. 
And of course, Scorpio, which was the first of these monks, betrays the master with the kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane. The continual ritual finally goes on till the winter solstice, which is ruled over by the symbol of death. And death here standing with its scythe and hourglass is the reaper of all things. And here at the winter solstice, the great sun god dies. He is betrayed, he is carried to the great place of the skull, which is called Golgotha. And here upon Calvarius, which is a naked skull, the cross presumably was erected. And here the sun god uh, is crucified over the body and remains of Adam, the primordial being. Now at the winter solstice, the sun seems to stand still for three days. The old astronomers were unable to estimate any motion of the solar body for three days. Thus at the winter solstice, it is said that the sun goes in or descends into the underworld and remains dead for three days. It therefore passes in the terms of its energy into the abode of the dead or into the abode of souls and there it remains for a certain period. It also remains in a strange processional for in the sacred rite the body of the dead sun god was carried in a procession a procession which bore it from the winter solstice to the vernal equinox. A procession of three days, three degrees, three months, according to the different symbols that are associated with the various faiths. Here again, the mystery of the three days is restored, for at the equinox also, the sun is not observed to move for three days. And at the end of these three days, at the actual moment of the equinox, the sun is reborn, rising as Kepera in its glory, promising the return of fertility after the long darkness of winter, in which the sun sleepeth, and all men rest, and the earth is without uh, light or nutrition. It is the problem of the long night in which light returns to the other world. After the vernal equinox, the sun marches in its splendor. It overcomes the ram. It rises above the power of the bull Apis. It comes under the power of the uh, Dioscori, Castor and Pollux, and again reaches its magnificent arch enthronement in the sign of the scarab. Now the Egyptians say that there was a mysticism to this. They pointed out even in those ancient days that when men die, they often, most usually, die in the night. And that when they die in the night, they most often die in that part of the night which just precedes the dawn. This is an old legend or an old fable. It is not necessarily universal, but the ancients believed that there was a certain tendency to a pattern here. They therefore further believed that in the so-called night part of the 24 hours of the day, or the night half of the 12 months of the year, the sun, by its mysteries, changed its vibratory pole. And therefore, while it is winter or darkness in the outer world, the sun becomes the particular illuminator of the inner life of things. Therefore, as man's objective concerns are advanced most rapidly in the period from the vernal equinox to the autumnal equinox, the diminishing of the physical sun is attended by the increase of the sun of the mystery. And therefore, that man's internal life is strengthened most during the period when his material energies are least exalted. 
So the Egyptians considered the period from the autumnal equinox to the vernal equinox, through the winter solstice, to be the period of great soul building. It was here that man's inner strength became greater than his outer strength. It was here also that because of the darkness of winter that had fallen upon his world, his ordinary and common labors were not fruitful. He could not go out in the snow and do the tasks of planting and reaping. And remember, all these things began in the agrarian period of our culture. Therefore, in the winter time, man had to remain under the shelter of whatever protection he had. He had to search for civilization in communion with those near to him. He had to invent and devise activities uh, which were not similar to those of the summer. He could not hibernate like some animal. Thus we may say that man's material progress was advanced in the summer and his intellectual growth was achieved in the winter. If there had been no winter, we might still be in the Stone Age. Because the winter was the time which men had to fill with an activity that was not material. Here was the time when they had to develop their cultures, their insights, their literary attainments, their artistry, and all the various forms of genius uh, which were made possible uh, because of the strange additional leisure which they had. If they provided themselves as well as they could during the good season and had put away the tithing of the 10% for the next year's seed, they then had security through the winter months. And this security was man's first leisure. And this leisure was the beginning of man's civilization. So in the long winter months, men grew as soul beings, or had the opportunity to so improve themselves. The Egyptians went further than this, however, by analogy. They insisted that there was actually a difference in the spiritual vibration and energy of the sun, by which the psychic life of man was most rapidly advanced at this time. But therefore, man inwardly grew. The dark inner nature of him received the light of the sun that was taken from his body. His material life grew less. His spiritual contact grew greater. Therefore, the greatest and most important event in the entire spiritual cycle of the sun mystery was reserved for the winter solstice, the midst of winter. For it was at the winter solstice, in the darkness, of man's own first internal neurotic existence that the messianic mystery was born. It was in the midst of the darkness of his own inner life that the first rays of the sun of the messianic dispensation, the Sotar of the Gnosis, was first heralded and the three winter signs of three wise men came to pay homage to the crib of the child. All of these point out that in the darkness of man's spiritual winter, the sun of the soul cast its greatest light. This was perfectly in conformity with the Egyptian ritual and with also many of the teachings of the Greeks, Hindus, and Chinese. Thus we have something that perhaps uh, is a little startling at first, but not as much so as you might imagine. Well, we have a strange belief in our daily living that through certain sorrows or through certain tribulations, the spiritual powers of man are quickened. But man never seeks light as much as when his darkness is the most difficult and dangerous. In this, therefore, we have the proper inducement. And if it be true, as the Egyptians said, that the sun's rays change their quality in the winter, so that they are attuned to the heart and soul focus rather than to the body focus. That in the winter the rays of the sun pierce through matter but do not quicken it and enter into the psychic life of things. 
But in the winter half of the year, so to say, or the uh, descending half or arc, all inner things are strengthened. In the outer part of the summer and spring and early fall months, the outer parts are strengthened. <coughs> but it is the light in the sea or in the soul of man which is the most important. So the sun in our winter shines into the inner part of our lives, rising in glory over the great fields of Amentet. The Egyptians are known to have used trances, hypnosis, and other similar devices in their religion. In this they were not essentially different from other primitive people. We know also that in trances and in sleep the Egyptians believed that they could come into the presence of the great gods of Amentet. Therefore that in this sleep of death, in this trance, man had an experience of inner life Always initiation and death were used as parallel symbolism. And the individual internalizing, searching for value, must seek for this internal sun which shines in the darkness, but is not known <coughs> by the darkness. If then, during this same season of the annual motion of the sun, from the autumnal equinox to the vernal equinox through the winter solstice, this sun is shining in a mentex. It means that the god has not died. It is not that the god is dead, it merely appears to be dead because it sleepeth. Now this god actually does not sleep in its own nature. When Osiris died, he did not merely rest in the Mastabar of the tomb. He went forth into another lower region and there ruled over the quick and the dead. In the same way, the soul of man in sleep does not merely lie down in darkness. It moves into another world where it is lighted by another sun. In the same way, man searching for value, passing through the ceremonies of the mystery ritual, is moving into another world which is lighted for the sun of the soul. And it is this ever coming sun which is the promise. It is this is the true light that lighteth every man who cometh into the world, for it is the light within himself. And this light is strengthened more in that time when material things are less favored. So the Egyptians actually believed that when the sun went to sleep for outward things it burst into glory inside of man and that when it sat in the west it rose in the east of man's heart and when it rose in the east of the earth it sat in the west of man's heart for man's outer works were works of the light of day but the inner mystery of his soul was were works of the light of night not the darkness of night well, there was no darkness except man's own ignorance of light. And each day the sun rising was like his own consciousness. For when he, when he woke in the morning, the sun rose through his eyes and through his sensory perceptions, and he saw the day. But when he went to sleep at night, the sun seemed to set, and he saw no more of the day. But the moment he was asleep, the Egyptians believed that he went into the world of another dawn. And here, within himself, the light continued to shine. I think Buddhism has much the same concept, but it points out the mysterious curtain which conceals the ship of the sun. That when it goes down over the mountains at, of the west, man no longer sees light. But man who has become inwardly wise is able to experience light. Like Apuleius, who initiated into the mysteries, stood upon the threshold of Persephone, the underworld, and declared that he beheld the sun shining beneath his feet under the earth. And so the sun of the inner world shines in the night. And this sun is our own psychic entity. 
their own psychic life and it gains its strength from the sun and just as the seed in the ground is quickened by the water and by the ray of the sun so the seed in the soul the seed of the tree of life and of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil these seeds are quickened by the Eucharist of the fire and water of the sun the Egyptian made much of this theology and he declared that it could be set upon the great astronomical form and would reveal to us the deeper meaning of many of the common and familiar symbols devices and ideas with which we are concerned today now our time is up and uh, I think it's time for you to all commune with the sun in your own soul in the quietude of rest.